religious beliefs. And there are times when Judaism uh, is pro-choice. There are times when it is not. It's a nuanced decision. Uh, and so I, I thought I would just spend a couple of minutes talking about, and I know we some of you did this with me before in a much more detailed fashion, but just to give you the basics, if you are entering into conversation with <laughs> and family of different faiths or of a different point of view, at least I'd like to, to you know, arm you with, well, that's too hostile. I would like to uh, inform you with <laughs> at least the basics of the Jewish point of view vis-a-vis -vis abortion, okay? And I'll try to do it quickly in five minutes or so, so that we can then go uh, into the Parsha. Let's turn to Exodus. Uh, let's turn to Exodus 21, 22. One sec, I have to get there myself. You would think I would have. Okay. Um, I'll give you just another second. Exodus chapter 21 verse 22. Actually, let's start with verse um, 18. Well, that's not what I want to do either. Um, Okay, let's go to verse 12, 22, oh, I'm sorry, 21, 12. Okay. And just to save time, I'm going to read. He who fatally, he who, oh, let's all mute, by the way, please. Thank you. Um, he who fatally strikes a man shall be put to death. <clears throat> If he and by man, obviously, we mean a person. If he or she did not do it by design, but it came about by an act of God, meaning sort of accidental in some way, I will assign you a place to which he can flee. So there were these seven cities of refuge where people who uh, accidentally killed another person could flee so that the family wouldn't take revenge or take justice into their own hands. But generally speaking, murder is a capital offense. Now, now we'll go to verse 22. When men fight and one of them pushes a pregnant woman and a miscarriage results, but no other damage ensues, the one responsible shall be fined according as the woman's husband may exact from him the payment to be based on reckoning okay now this is the foundational juxtaposition of texts that informs the jewish position on abortion because it establishes the fact from a jewish perspective that the status of the fetus is not the same as the status of a human being, of a living human being. If you murder someone, it's a capital offense. If you cause a miscarriage, it's a fine. It's not nothing, it's important, it has gravitas, but it is subordinate to human life. That is the most basic guiding principle for what we call halakha, Jewish law, when it comes to abortion. Now, many of you know that Jewish law was developed over two main periods. One, of course, the Torah. The second, what we call the rabbinic period, which was from roughly about the year uh, zero. <laughs> uh, you know, we know the Mishnah was codified in the year 200. So from, let's call it the year zero in the common era, uh, until about the seventh century. Okay, that that's the second major, and that's where we get Talmud commentaries, midrash, etc. So, what happens to this basic principle when it gets into the hands of the rabbis, who were more deliberative and and 
studied and and adjudicated nuance? The first thing is that it could never be, abortion could never be classified as murder. The fetus was not believed to have a soul, nefesh, or a nishama, mm -hmm. until, as Rashi puts it, it comes into the world. And the way the rabbis defined that was when the head and shoulder had exited the birth canal. In other words, when the baby could breathe. The word, as we know, for soul in Hebrew is the same as the word for breath. Same word. Now, when was abortion allowed? Clearly, if the mother's life was in danger. Because the mother has a soul. The fetus does not. Now, the other thing that happens is in the 6th century oh no I'm sorry not 6th century um, in the 16th century 1500s a rabbi in Germany named Jacob Emden makes a ruling based on a case of a woman who became pregnant as a result of incest and he allows the abortion saying that for her to have to give birth to this child and raise it and have it in the world would cause psychological danger to the point of endangering her death. And this is the first time we know of that a rabbi now rules for a, 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 in favor of something that I think technically we would have to call non-therapeutic abortion because the mother's physical life is not in danger. But his point is that her emotional state will be so disturbed that it could very well endanger her life. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, we're talking six centuries ago. And from that point on, rabbis have uh, factored this into their decision. Now, this doesn't, what does this not mean? This does not mean that if you have a Tay-Sachs baby or a Down syndrome baby or triplets, unless your life is in danger giving birth to triplets, it does not mean that according to Jewish law that abortion would be warranted because Judaism does not assign any relative value to life. All lives are of equal value. Whether you have uh, some kind of debilitating disease or not, your life is of equal value. So anybody who says to you, oh, Judaism is in favor of abortion or Judaism is diametrically opposed to abortion, neither, neither is true. It's a, it's a nuanced understanding. And the answer, I guess, to like most Jewish questions is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I really, so often when people ask me a question about Judaism, I start with, it depends, because it does. And that's the beautiful thing about our faith and our legal system. So uh, that's, that's sort of really just a primer. That's just 101. If you want to know more, there's tons of stuff on the internet um, that, that you can drill down into uh, yourselves. But we certainly uh, differentiate and there is no way under Jewish law or the Jewish perspective that abortion could be perceived as murder. Okay, any questions about that, statements about that? Uh, Panina, go ahead, unmute though. Uh, my um, curiosity was about the wood nefesh. Yeah. What do you call a soul? Um, um, when God created the world at the seventh day, it says, Vaish bot bayomashvi, vayi nafash. And he took a vacation, he took a rest. So the word nefesh is, you're still alive, you're still there, it's still there. It's just you're taking a, a breather, you're taking yeah, but, a rest. But the, the question is, when does, when is okay, it? Okay, that's not right. what I'm trying to say. It's just right. that the word nefesh 
has a, a, a different meaning that a lot of people think that it's actually being either nefesh chaya or no, not at all. Was it like you are alive or not at all? How would you explain that the word really means resting in a vacation? It, well, because it, there is houses, places in Israel that are called batei nofesh, which means that those are um, places that a person goes to get better. Or I to, think Panina, Panina, and you know this, that biblical Hebrew and rabbinic Hebrew are not the same. Okay. And I think that that's really the answer is that the rabbis interpreted nefesh as a, a human being. And the Torah uses the word differently, right? So that's really <laughs> well. It does. It's a. It uses it as both, and it's it a biblical. Is. It's when it, you go. That's it. Yes, but the rabbis use the word nefesh to define a living person. Okay. Yeah, I mean they do. So it's just or a not. difference. Either it's dead a, or alive, not just in suspension. Yes. Like resting. Yes, and so it's a different use of the word. Okay. Um, let's see, Miriam, I, uh, wait, um, wait, wait, Miriam's next and then we'll keep going. We may not get to the Parsha, but that's okay. I think we're all, we're all feeling this tension today and I, I think it's important that we talk about it. Miriam. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you for bringing it up. Uh, and yes, it's beyond tension that I feel. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm truly disturbed. Yeah. Um, what you touched on. I would like to go deeper with that. These Supreme Court justices are absolutely anti-freedom of religion. And I think we have to stress that. This country find plenty of faults with it, of course, but it is a magnificent country that stresses that each person is allowed to worship as they please. And my Judaism tells me that you, Supreme Court injustices, are telling me that my granddaughter, God forbid, must carry to life a baby, a fetus rather, when she was, God forbid, raped. Yeah. Yes. So you cannot tell yeah. me that, and you cannot tell me that this does not endanger the emotional life of a mother. Yeah. Mary, plus, I, the I think, plus the unwanted child. Plus I, the unwanted child. Yeah, I, I think we're all, you know, uh, I can't say that we all. I think many of us share your uh, concern and your outrage. And the... The issue of the wall of separation between church and state, this is where I think it, and I'm not by any means a legal or Supreme Court or constitutional scholar, not even close. But I, I do know that this idea of the wall of separation, which goes back, that phrase goes back, the separation of church and state is a phrase that goes back to the 1650s, before our country was founded the wall of separation between church and state in the minds of the founding fathers was really about keeping the state out of the church's business. That, that was the point. Now, now we're in a position where, but there's two sides to a wall, right? It also ideally, although that was not the original intent, should keep the church out of the state's business because there are two sides to a wall. And technically, we all understand that this is about giving it to the states and that the Supreme Court, this is not a federal thing and that they're not taught, the Supreme Court doesn't legislate. And like, I get all the technical, you know, I'm, I'm reading all the stuff that co is coming back to me from my Instagram post and technically, it is correct that this is not about the separation of church and state. However, however, I think it is naive to assume that some of the justices positions are not informed by the Christian belief that life begins at conception. And I think anybody who dodges that is just living with 
you know, blinders on. And uh, so I, I think, you know, I've, I'm a religious person, obviously. I don't want the state involved in my religion, but I don't want my religion involved in the state either. It's not good for religion and it's not good for the state. Uh, it's an important wall. And for me, I'm just speaking to you, you know, you're my family and I'm speaking to you uh, from my heart. When this wall, when this wall weakens, it is, it is bad for everyone. It is bad for everyone. Uh, and, and I love being a Jew, you know that, but we have to preserve the autonomy of the individual within reason uh, to, to live their own lives. You know, freedom of religion has to include freedom from religion. Uh, because that's one of the things that defines a democracy, except, by the way, for the state of Israel, which is a huge problem. But that's, that's for another day. Um, so let's just take a couple more comments, because I would like to get to the Torah portion. Uh, Risa, go ahead, unmute. I would like to urge everyone on this Zoom, when we finish, to go to wrj.org and or the rack.org. R-A-C, R-A-C. R-A-C, right. uh, the Religious Action Center. They have been all over the internet today. And uh, there are emails. Uh, those of you who, who are uh, connected with WRJ, you'll be receiving things from advocacy. And uh, there are actions to take immediately. Uh, it's not over. We have things that we can do, and it's very important that you know what they are. So these two organizations are working together. Everything has both the WRJ um, icon uh, um, logo logo, and, and the, the one of the rack. Hey, Risa, would you do us a favor? Very important. Would you? It is important. Would you do us a favor and just post those links in the chat for everyone? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Lorraine, go ahead. Yes, um, I found it really interesting that this week's Parsha actually talks about fear and that the day's events just elicited these feelings of fear, angst mm -hmm. that we see on the Parsha as well. So yeah. I'm very interested about seeing how you... It's a good or, yeah, how we could make a connection to yes. that. Yeah, um, it's a good segue. Yeah, yeah, because it's not only the abortion, but also there was a mention about evaluating other rights that had been yes. established and that, I don't know, it's just a very, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to jump into it. I think that's a great segue. Uh, so now let's go to Deuteronomy. Now, I know this isn't the Parsha, but I want you to read this. We need to read this first in order to understand a point I'm going to make about the Parsha. So Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy sorry, 1, 22 and 23. Deuteronomy 1. I have to get there myself. Give me a second. What did you say, Deuteronomy? One. One. Yeah. yeah, one. This is the one. Okay, I'm almost there. Okay. All right. Verse 22. Deuteronomy 1. Sorry, I got to let someone in. Okay, here we go. Now, Deuteronomy is a kind of repri repri reprise, uh, uh, like, what's the opposite of an, what's the, what's the opposite of an overture? Somebody who's a Broadway, I don't know what it is, but it's coda. It's a coda. Okay, thank you. So this is a coda. The whole book of Deuteronomy is kind of a revisiting, it means the second teaching, right? 
and do duo deuteronomy so here's the review of what we're going to read in our parsha and i'll just read it for you okay then all of you came to me all of you the israelites the the former slaves then all of you came to me and said let us send men ahead to reconnoiter the land to spy the land for us and bring back word on the route we shall follow in the cities we shall come to okay you asked me for this this is god to the people all right now now we're going to go to our parsha shlach lecha rabbi yes if me is not capitalized how can that refer to god it's it's moses speaking on yeah. behalf of god okay and uh all right let's go let's go to shlachacha okay and this is a retelling of the story which i'm just gonna kind of retell for you here we have a retelling of the story but there's a really important difference and let's start right at verse one in this version it says the lord spoke to moses saying send men to scout the land of canaan which i am giving to the israelite people send one from each of their so in this version god is requesting the sending but in the original version which deuteronomy is the coda for or of it's it's god through moses okay now why is this important so what happens next and i don't want to take the time to read it what happens next is the spies go 12 spies go they come back and this is kind of a retelling of the story in in this book of numbers they go they spend 40 days there they spy out the land they come back carrying a cluster of grapes that is so huge it takes two men to carry it on a pole across their shoulders and the grapes are hanging down from the pole this by the way is the logo for the israeli uh tour board of, of tours right you see it on all the taxis this is where it comes from and the spies say it's a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey grapes the size of basketballs well they didn't quite say that but you get the idea but it's inhabited by fierce people by nephilim and, and Anakites by by fierce people and by giants and we now this is the important part and we felt like grasshoppers in front of them that's the report of 10 of the spies two of the spies Joshua and Caleb they don't dispute that there were fierce people and giants there all they say is we can do it yeah they're big people there they're fierce but we we can prevail and of course the rabbis understand this as their belief that they can prevail being their faith in god's promise when god said i will you know bear you on the wings of eagles right You'll be born on eagles' wings to the promised land, which I will give to you and your offspring to come. You'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sands on the, on the shore of the sea. And so we have 10 people who say, we felt small. And we have two who said, we can do it. God promised. And I see in this, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I see a really important uh, theological idea. First of all, God gets so angry that he says, 
this whole generation except Joshua and Caleb, you all have to die in the wilderness because you will never rid yourselves of the mentality of slaves. You will never overcome your past trauma. At first, God wants to just wipe them out in a plague, and the 10 spies are killed in a plague. And we'll get to Moses' interceding for the people in a moment. Now, I'm going to ask you to guess why I might see this as a very, as a, as a really profound uh, theological, actually almost a theodicy, the, the, the problem of God and evil question. And it does relate, Lorraine, to fear, which we're going to get to in a moment. So anybody want to take a guess at the idea that the people wanted this? And that 10 of the 12 felt like grasshoppers and didn't believe in the promise. And two of them did. Yeah, Donna, go ahead. Unmute. Well, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. You There's no wrong. Say. There's no <laughs> wrong answer. Because what I'm about to suggest is just one one idea there's no wrong answer it seems to me that there's some symbolism in this that the people who have no confidence the people who have no faith they are going to literally and figuratively remain in this wilderness until they die whereas the people who have confidence are eventually going to make it out mm -hmm. and so that it says to us we must have confidence and faith that we can get through difficult times. And was there any evidence for them to base that confidence and faith on? Well, you could say, sure, God took them out of Egypt and he parted the yes. sea. And that was kind With of pretty an good. Outstretched <laughs> arm and a mighty hand. Right. right. So if he can and do that, he could probably take us into the land and get rid of those mean giant people. Yeah. And by the way, the slave, the the uh, Israelites are also romanticizing the past because they start complaining and saying, "Oh, <laughs> uh, where are the onions and the garlic and the leeks, leeks. and the melons we had in Egypt? You brought us out here to die in the desert, and all we have is this manna to eat." By the way, which was this amazing substance that God provided six days a week, a double portion on Shabbat. That's why enough have, is enough. Why we have two halot, <laughs> by the way, on Shabbat. And it tasted, according to the Torah, like cakes made of sweet cream. Uh, and other, there's a midrash that says that manna tasted like whatever you wanted it to taste like, which is <laughs> crazy good, I think. Um, so there's ample evidence, but fear grips to Lorraine's point, fear and it's also something else, grips the traumatized people. Brad, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> I wonder if it isn't some kind of statement about the fallibility of our senses. Uh, you know, we've got different people seeing things differently. Of course, based on their perspective of where they are in relation to what they're looking at. So yes. if our senses are not reliable, and that is a philosophical question that's been around for centuries, then there is an alternative. And the alternative here is faith. Yes, I think it's a really important point. The Talmud puts it this way. We do not see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. I, that's a very powerful idea. Mm -hmm. First of all, ideally, it creates some empathy in us. Right. Even for the 10. This was a traumatized people. 400 years of slavery. How could normalcy be expected of such a person or of such a people? I feel this way about survivors and their children. 
how could we expect normalcy mm -hmm. of such a traumatic, traumatic experience in life? So ideally, this idea of we see the world not as, it, not as it is, but as we are, ideally, initially, I would hope, creates some degree of empathy rather than harsh judgment. It, I, I really think the world and, and we would be much better if we begin from that position. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to go Stacy and then Carol and then uh sukasa and miriam because you guys have already had a shot stacy go ahead oh susan you're you too Oy. go ahead okay i don't know if this is maybe getting off track but it's just something that occurs to me when you talked about empathy i often think about judaism in with respect to a uh, religion of tolerance and that's how i saw it. it's, it's yes sort of i so what do you think about that? I think that is not true historically of most of Judaism. Mm -hmm. Frankly, frankly, it's a pretty intolerant mm -hmm. uh, faith because we were so fearful of assimilation mm -hmm. uh, and violence. And, uh, and there are streams of Judaism, which uh, in my view are not tolerant, highly intolerant. Mm -hmm. But I would agree with you that tolerance is a value expressed expressed by Reform Judaism. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's always lived. Yeah, expressed. And, and that, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a professed value, Stacy. Yes, okay. but there is a lot of intolerance, even in what I would call the progressive, and I don't mean politically; I mean religiously progressive. Jewish community. And, and I hear it. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of intolerance on the far left and there's a lot of intolerance on the far right. Right. Among Jews. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a professed value, right? But I'm, I'm not convinced that it's a, a fully realized, actualized or lived value. Well, and also, don't you think just because we we adhere to something as a common good, that doesn't mean we practice it. And That's my point. It's a prof <laughs> it's a professed it's a professed value. Right. It's not always a lived value. Right. And boy, do people hate it when you point it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Carol. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, I hear the. The truth to my experience of staying in your own cul-de-sac, whether you're on the left or on the right. And I appreciated one of the first things you said today about the flexibility within Reform Judaism. My, my beliefs don't have to be exactly like any other Reform Jew, um, but there are these basic tenets, which um, we, as you say, we like to say we adhere to. My question might be, not off the subject, but I'm just curious, and maybe some others are. 10 is a minion, 10 of the commandments. These 10 were doubters and frightened and, tra and traumatized, but why 10? Well, there were 12 tribes, so it's 10 of the 12. You know, sometimes the victor writes, writes the history, and it was really Joshua and Caleb, according to Torah, who did lead the people into the promised land. Joshua succeeded Moses as the senior rabbi of the Jewish people. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, sometimes sometimes we're looking at anachronisms and, and the victor writing history. Um, the original 10 idea of 10 for a minion came from also kind of a negative example when Abraham, when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, what if there are 50 righteous people there? Are you going to destroy the city be, and not, you know, and, and God says, okay, if you can find 50, fine. And then he says, what if it's 40? You can, for lack of 10, you're going to, and 30, 20, and he gets down to 10 and he could not find 10 righteous people. And that's where we believe the idea of 10 comprising a minion comes from, but nobody really knows for sure. Thank you. 
Yeah, there are these important biblical numbers. 40 is an important, they were in Israel, they were spying the land for 40 days. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses was up on Mount Sinai for 40 days to receive the Torah. You know, there, and, and um, four is an important number. There were, think about the Haggadah, four sons, four cups of wine, four questions, mm -hmm. all based on the four promises of redemption. So there are, listen, we have this too in our, in our secular American culture, right? I, I don't, I don't like to stop the gas pump on 13. <laughs> I, I don't even know why, but I just don't, you know? Um, <laughs> so we all have like a certain amount of numerical Michigas. Uh, you know, we, we just do. Uh, and, and that's okay. Now I promised, I think Susan, you're next. Please unmute. I assume it's me, not Suka. <laughs> Correct. Sukasa is after you. Okay. Um... I want to go back to your initial opening from yes. Deuteronomy and yes. explaining the difference then and the theological reason why. It seems yeah. to me that in this case, uh, the Deuteronomy, I think it was very enlightening that you pointed it out, but it seems like God is pointing his finger at, uh, at the people then. He's reinterpreting. It's like an argument between spouses or kids. You started this, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your take on that? Okay. So the, I'm glad you redirected because we should get to this. In my view, the difference is, and, and this is not just me, this is also uh, Nachmanides and other commentators, that the real sin is that the people asked for spies at all in the first place. What do you need spies for if God said, I'm going to, you know, you'll be born on eagle's wings to the promised land. Why, why, why do you need to appoint spies? So it's, it's sort of the, the sin was not just in the report the spies brought back, but in the fact that the people even wanted spies to go in and reconnoiter the land. Like, what are you, God already told you this is going to work out. What's wrong with you people? Right. So, um, wait, Susan, wait. So that's a point of view if the people made the request to send in spies. Right. But if God says send in spies, then it's not demonstrating a lack of faith. And that's right. where we get this, this tension, right? Now, why am I making such a big deal out of that, okay? So I'm, I'm, going, to, um, I'm going to quote Talmud here, and then I'm going to back it up with some examples. But first, the quote. We are led by the path we wish to pursue. <laughs> we are led by the path we wish to pursue. We can either long for the onions and the leeks and the garlic and the melons <laughs> and the, the certitude of servitude <laughs> or we can be on the path to be born on eagle's wings to the promised land. We can be guided by the report of the spies, or we can be guided by God's promise. We can be guided by our past trauma and think little to nothing of ourselves, or we can be guided by a different kind of aspirational way of seeing ourselves. Remember, they said, we felt like grasshoppers in front of them. We don't really know how small they were compared to these Anakites, but couldn't be that small. I mean, I, I have a picture of me. Maybe I'll show you if I can find it quickly on my phone later, standing next to Shaq. And I didn't feel, I didn't feel like a grasshopper. I mean, I felt small, but I didn't feel like a grasshopper. Right? So, so now... We, what does this mean theologically? Why is this important theologically? Because it means that God doesn't prevent us from going our own way. We're not puppets. God, Torah, tradition, whatever word you want to use, halakha, choose your word. 
if the word God doesn't work for you. Puts forth a path for us, but cannot force us to walk that path. God doesn't prevent us from doing our own thing. We have free will. We have agency. We have autonomy. Again, use whatever word you want. And that's why I think this is theologically important. So what you're saying then is people didn't have to follow God's command to do the scouting. Now that you brought up the Deuteronomy part, yes. we didn't have to, we, the Israelis didn't, Israel well, didn't have to follow that command. No, to be honest, I am basing this more on the former than the latter, more on the people making this request than God. I think if God said to do it, then I, I have a harder time saying the people didn't follow God's path because they did. So I am basing it, but I want to be honest about the text. We have both, both paths, both ideas are in the Torah. And I don't want to pretend it's only one to make my point, right? You know, that's not fair. That's why I raise both. And we all have to draw our own conclusions. But I think the bigger meta idea is that God does not prevent us from doing what we do. God can encourage, influence, set the way, but ultimately we have agency. And fear, to Lorraine's point, which I think is so important, it is very often it is fear that, that prevents us from getting to the promised land, what, metaphorically. You know, I'm going to talk about uh, my new book for one second and not to sell it, but it's germane to this point. The first question is, what do you regret? What is your greatest regret? And the common denominator is that what most people regret most is not something they did, what they didn't but, do. but something they didn't do. There are two types of sins that we atone for on Yom Kippur. And, and they're actually sins against God and sins against people, yes. But there are two categories of sins. Sins of commission, the things we did, but also sins of omission. The things we failed to do, the words we didn't say, the time we didn't show up, the, the you know, opportunity we didn't grasp. And that is almost always the result of fear, some kind of fear. And you don't get to the promised land when you are dominated by fear. Now, but I have empathy. I want to say this. I think it's fine these people died in the desert. They were not, they were not capable of freedom for very understandable reasons. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't shed that part of their identity. And I understand that. And I'm okay with them living their lives in the desert for 40 years. Um, Pamela, go ahead. Unmute though. Let's help them. Does it mic work? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. No, it doesn't always work sometimes. Um, so what I had written down actually was that Faith over helps overcome the fear and it provides the courage. So when you were talking about the theological lesson of this, to me, if I'm an early rabbi trying to convince people to believe in God, then you're going to say, okay, faith will help you overcome this kind of fear. If you believe in this greater thing, then you use that as a tool to overcome your fear. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's yes, the lack of faith creates the fear. The fear is there. It's a lack of faith, however you want to put it. But finding the faith then helps you overcome it. And I think it provides the courage. That's what I was going to add. And, in it. and you know what? Some people can. Some can't. And some can't. Right. And I think that's also <laughs> part of the, um, the message and structure of the narrative. Some people can. They all saw the same thing. And they were all slaves. And we see this among Holocaust survivors. 
some some can move forward and some can only move and this is and this is entirely without judgment entirely without judgment mm -hmm. i'm okay that some people are not are, are don't want to get out of the desert don't want to leave slave don't want to transcend their trauma and slavery i understand that i have nothing but empathy for that <coughs> one one of the things that also that i thought of in this whole conversation was that you know there are a ton of studies about people who pray and who have a strong belief in god are happier people generally and i think it kind of all ties into this productivity, like feeling that you have agency over your life, ironically, right? Like you have faith in this thing that you can't see, touch or feel, but it gives you a greater feeling of agency over your life, which is what it takes if you know, yeah, okay, these may be huge people and we may have all felt like grasshoppers, but we can do it. And, you can yeah, have your and, own yeah. and if it's a, if that's a theological leap for people, how about history itself? How about the history of the Jewish people? You know, I remember when COVID hit, for some reason, this is a small example that jumps into my mind. When COVID hit and we were locked down, I had all these parents calling me, said, what do we do about the bar mitzvah? What do we do about the bar mitzvah? I said, there were B'nai mitzvah in Auschwitz. We go, we have it. What, you know, we have a history of, of persevering through these things. Now, some of them said, well, that's very nice, Rabbi, but we're going to postpone. But some of them had it. Hmm. And, and so if, you do, if, you, if the faith isn't necessarily a, uh, one that is uh, in, in, in God or at least some faith in the nature of Jewish history and the Jewish people, right? They're, wherever you summon your faith from, that's your business. But yes, I agree with you that it does uh, to be able to see beyond the present circumstances or the past. You know, one of my favorite sayings is I've given up all hope of a better past. <laughs> it's really, think about that. That's good. When people come to see me to talk about regret, the first thing I say to them is I've given up all hope of a better past because it's kind of a triage approach. It's like, okay, now we have to talk about the future because we we cannot re-engineer the past the past is really about the present and the future right. that by the way is a, uh, a an idea the jewish people brought to the world mm. that the past does not repeat itself that we we're moving in a linear fashion not a circular fashion mm. and you know <sighs> When uh, Santiana said that if we forget the past, we're doomed to repeat it, that's true. But I think it is equally true that if we only remember the past, we are also doomed to repeat it. And this was the slavery issue, right? Uh, and and I, I think that's a very, very important point. I learned that from Rabbi Harold Schulweis, who was one of the greats. He said, yes, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it, but those who only remember the past are also doomed to repeat it. Okay, Sukasa, I, you have your, your hand up. And I okay, um, I'm gonna go back to your comment about empathy, where you said that we do not see the world as it is, but as we are. I think that sometimes rather than having people, uh, encouraging people to have empathy, it does just the bad, just the opposite. Well, because they don't have an issue with X or Y, they have no sympathy for somebody that does. Right. For instance, people with eating problems or yep. people with alcohol problems. I think that well, I don't have a problem with alcohol. Why should I feel sorry for that person? And I think we see a lot of that in the a world. And maybe that goes to your comment about when people, they talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. Yes. And, you know, I go back to the plague of darkness, the ninth plague in the Pesach story. 
And the rabbis ask, well, how, what was this darkness? Was it just a 24 hour night or was it something else? And one of the things they say is that it was so dark that no person could get up mitachtav from his own position or get out from underneath himself or herself to see the other. That's how dark it was. The 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 ancient the, the Hebrews and the is and the Egyptians couldn't see each other because they couldn't get out of their own place mitachtav up from underneath themselves. I've heard many Jewish people say, "Well, look at the Jewish people and how we rose," and then they look at the African American, which is not the, it's not the same. It's not a, a not at all. apples and apples, not and they don't have any kind of empathy. Yeah, well, there's actually no such thing as apples and apples, period. Every person's, every person's life is unique. There is no, in numbers, yes, two plus two and three plus one, apples and apples. But when we're talking about human beings and human life, there is no such thing as apples to apples. For, forget it. I'm one of five kids, okay? All five of us were raised under a different roof. <laughs> We, but we all have the same address. <laughs> and you, those of you who have siblings, you know that. Every child is raised under a different roof. <laughs> there are no apples to apples. <laughs> and we either approach that with judgment or empathy. Okay, now I see I, we've got two hands. R wait, wait, but I've got, I wanna let people that haven't had a chance yet, if you don't mind, and uh, let me see, Hannah, I thought you said, let me see what we have here. I'm really sorry, guys. M Mara, do we, is Mara, Mara, Mara? Yes, Mara. Where are you, Mara? I'm here. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, there you are. Good, Mara and Harp, got it. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, I, I was looking at the portion and it interested me that the Hebrew is uh, shalach lecha, Right. And it reminded me of Lech Lecha yes. to, yeah. to being ordered to come out of yourself, to come out of your home, your safe place and go. Yeah. One could translate it as send yourself. Hmm. Just like Lech Lecha can either mean go forth, go out, or go toward yourself. Lech Lecha, go to yourself, be yourself, be you. Right. Live that truth. I think it's a very astute and good point. Yes. Yes. Uh, OK, now that we've given, I think, every all our newcomers a pants or chance, let's I want to make one more point. But first, we'll go to Panina and Miriam. OK, and then then I want to move on because we are. Oh, my goodness. We only have two minutes. So make it okay, short. I'm going to make it. I, I had my hand raised before her, but it's OK. Well, you're both going to get a chance. Don't worry. Okay, I'm gonna to try to make it really short. I think the experiences of what was going on through the years, through the generations, gave the opportunity for people to come up with new laws. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. This is not all the Ten Commandments, and that's it. We have 300 and some 60 something that according to the fringes and the talit that we count that many mitzvot that we're supposed to fulfill. That's because the conditions require them yes. to, to exist. So uh, the whole thing was a process. It was all a process. They did send some people before it didn't work out. They sent them again later, it did work out. Yeah. It depends on the condition in the world yes. that makes the necessity to come up with different laws. With new I laws. agree. I mean, that's why Jewish law is called halacha, which means to Absolutely. go. And you, depending on the rabbis, yes. Yep. So they depends on what era they lived in, and this is where the laws developed. And so it's, and it's true today. Exactly. Uh, okay, good point. So Miriam, go ahead. Okay, then, mine, mine is very brief, and, and you literally don't have to answer it. I'm just bringing it up. Pasuk 33, which says we were like grasshoppers in their eyes, says yeah. something else which we skipped over. It says... Uh, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of the giant from among the Nephilim. We were like grasshoppers in our eyes. Right. And so we were in their eyes. Yes. But we did and not. All, 
That's all their that's all their projection. Right. And you answered it in many ways. And I want to thank you for a wonderful, informative session. Excellent. You, you are so welcome. Um, and hopefully today we, we glean from this, even even in our anger, um, some faith in uh, and and uh, maybe even a little empathy for people we disagree with um, and also some courage. Uh, let us not be grasshoppers. Let us not be grasshoppers. We in are our own, uh, in our own eyes. That correct. We are not grasshoppers, okay? Unless we uh, believe we are. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, once again, the Torah is utterly amazing, and you guys are amazing. Uh, I want to wish you Shabbat Shalom, and uh, Shabbat hope, Shalom to you. Thank you. I hope everybody has a beautiful, beautiful weekend out there, uh, and Shabbat Shalom to all. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Rabbi. Bye. Rabbi Lynn, are you still there? Be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.